Okay, it's 10 o'clock and we'll get started. Hello everyone and welcome to the Healing Community Study Learning Collaborative. My name is Lisa Romley and I am the Program Educational Coordinator for the HEAL Study. We are here today to learn about harm reduction programs and vending machines and implementing best practices. I just need to review some housekeeping announcements before we get started. Just a reminder that this session is being recorded and if your screen name is not your full name, you're using either a partial name or your phone, if you could please update that now and change it to your full name, this helps when we compare the participants' names to the registration list. We are offering CE credits for this session today. One CE credit has been approved for physicians, pharmacists, nurses, social workers, and licensed alcohol and drug counselors. And I'll give you information at the end of the session on how to obtain the CE credits. We also offer a certificate of attendance for anyone that wants that. We do ask that you stay on mute if you're not speaking and that just helps reduce the echo and extraneous noises. If you have any questions and we do welcome your questions, please use either the raised hand feature where you can click on reaction and then click on the raised hand or just type your question in the chat box and we'll read it sometime during the session. We also want to announce that for today's session, all presenters have said they do not have any financial relevant financial relationships to disclose. The practice gap that we have identified is naloxone represents a safe and effective standard of care for reversal of opioid overdose, but systemic barriers can result in a lack of access, providing innovative ways to access naloxone to individuals at high risk of experiencing or witnessing an opioid overdose can increase the chance of future successful reversal. The educational needs that will be addressed is understanding the appropriate resources needed to establish a harm reduction vending machine. The learning objectives for today's session, we're going to talk about the benefits, the best practices, and challenges of establishing a harm reduction vending machine. And then hopefully at the end of today's session, you'll be able to um, know the steps, the resources, and the finances needed for establishing a harm reduction machine. So for today's session, we have Dr. April Young, who will be moderating this session. Dr. Young is a professor in the Department of Epidemiology and the Center on Drug and Alcohol Research at the University of Kentucky. And over the past decade, she has led several federally funded projects on substance use and harm reduction with a focus primarily in Appalachia. She also leads community engagement team for the Healing Community Study in Kentucky. And I will now turn it over to her to provide an overview of harm reduction vending machines and introduce our speakers. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so I'm excited to see all of you here today to talk about this innovative strategy to deliver harm reduction services. Um, this is new, I think, to many of us in Kentucky, but it's been going on quite a long time around the world. The first machines were opened uh, in the late 80s in Denmark. So these have been around for more than 30 years. Um, and research has been done on vending machines for the past 27 years. So um, you can see there on the right, two different models of vending machines. One um, reflects the traditional food vending machine and the other is a smaller unit um, that resembles more of a newspaper type machine. Next slide. These machines operate in a variety of different ways. They're very flexible. Um, people can simply select the supply and then have that supply vended. Um, or they can uh, access the machine through a swipe card, a token, um, a code entry, or even cash or credit card. It all depends on how the program would want to establish um, the setup of the machine. The machines can be temper temperature controlled or non-temperature controlled. Um, and so that allows them to be installed in places outside and still maintain a, a appropriate temperature for substances like naloxone. Um, and some vending machines even come with software that can alert uh, programs that they are low in stock and can track things like use and use over time and repeat encounters and so on. Some of the supplies that have been stocked in vending machines in the past uh, include uh, naloxone, sharps containers, safe injection supplies, fentanyl test strips, wound care kits, food and water, uh, really anything um, you can imagine can be stocked in these if it'll fit in the slots. Um, there have even been um, newer uh, programs that have stocked medications um, in these machines. 
Next slide. So I know a lot of folks are concerned about crime and safety and thinking about a doing a vending machine model of harm reduction. And there's quite a bit of research that has shown that these adverse events um, do not occur. And so there's been extensive research in Australia and they use closed captioning TV, they monitored crime data, they used other sources of information to examine um, whether or not there's loitering, crime increases, use of machines um, by children and so on. And what they found is there was no evidence of what they called a honeypot effect, where it would draw people from other parts of, um, in this case, Sydney, to where the machine is located. Uh, there was no increase in loitering around the machine. There was no increase in crime over time. Um, using the closed captioning TV, they found no use by children under the age of 16. Um, they also uh, found no increase in the number of publicly discarded syringes around the machines and no increase in vandalism. Next slide. So the interest in vending machines is surging and um, they are in Nevada and you'll hear from speakers from Nevada today. They're in Puerto Rico and in other states and in one of the most um, recent uh, expansions in Ohio. So just across the river in Cincinnati, they've established um, these machines. So I know there are several questions entered when you registered about the legal context here in Kentucky, and I'm not a legal professional, I'm not giving legal advice, but these are the enabling statutes um, that allow us to set up these vending machines. So KRS 217-186 um, was originally enacted in 2013, it was a recently revised, and it allows for the dispensing of naloxone to a person or agency under a standing order um, via a pharmacy protocol or um, regular prescription. And what this does is it authorizes a person or agency to receive, possess, administer, or provide um, as part of a harm reduction program, naloxone, to people who've been trained. Next slide. So how do you define an agency? Um, it can be a peace officer, jailer, firefighter, paramedic, uh, emergency medical technician, or school employee. And, um, and the agency, is protected under the law uh, in that they shall be immune from criminal and civil liability for the provision or administration of, of naloxone in this case, um, unless there is personal injury from gross negligence, which is a very high bar to set. Next slide. So nothing in the statute specifies or limits the ways an agency can provide naloxone. Um, what's key to the legal provision in Kentucky is that the person must receive training. How that training is done, however, is specified by the person signing the standing order agreement. Next slide. What about syringe vending machines? Um, so we have Kentucky's drug paraphernalia law. Many of you probably know about the um, policies around our harm reduction programs currently in Kentucky. And um, essentially it would allow for a local health department to establish a harm reduction program in any format they choose and that is approved by the local officials. Um, and so in this case, they could establish a program that vended syringes uh, as part of their harm reduction program. Next slide. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our more exciting um, panel of speakers and introduce them just quickly. So our first speaker today is going to be Dr. Brad Ray. He's a senior researcher at RTI International. Um, who is trained as a sociologist and he conducts research aimed at overdose prevention through incorporating harm reduction strategies. Dr. Ray has spent nearly a decade in higher education as a professor and a research center director. Most of his recent research has focused on evaluating policies and interventions aimed at the overdose epidemic and on translating evidence-based practices, um, evidence-based strategies into practice. Next, we'll have Chelsea Cheatham, who has spearheaded the design and implementation of the first harm reduction vending machines in the continental US. She is the program manager for the Track B Exchange in Nevada and has implemented vending machines in a variety of settings. She's experienced overcoming the challenging, both logistical and political, that accompany implementation of these programs. She regularly consults with interested parties who um, are trying to work to establish vending machine models of harm reduction. Presenting with Chelsea is Jessica Johnson. Um, she's a senior health educator at the Southern Nevada Health District. In this role, she works to coordinate stakeholders and coalition groups to build capacity and develop programming for harm reduction vending machines. 
And finally, we will have some comments from Derek Jackson, a social worker who became a police officer and who now helps to run a police agency. As a social worker and certified law enforcement officer, he has a unique perspective and role in building bridges between law enforcement and the communities they serve. In his position as Director of Community Engagement, Mr. Jackson has helped to reimagine the role of police within the community and the role social workers can play within law enforcement. And so without further delay, I wanna turn it over now to our first speaker, Dr. Ray. Thanks, April. Let me get the share screen going here. All right. All right, assuming we're good to go here. All right, so uh, my name is Brad Ray. I am from uh, RTI International. Uh, today, I'm gonna talk about how I came upon seeing the importance of distributing naloxone uh, to justice-involved populations, uh, how we identified vending machines as a way to do this, and then a little bit about my experience of scaling and implementing the idea to multiple jail facilities uh, in the Midwest. So just by way of introduction um, and some background, I got involved in harm reduction research about 20 years ago when someone close to me overdosed from heroin and was saved by naloxone. Uh, after that, I got involved in research in Chicago using overdose data to map where deaths were occurring. Went on to get a PhD and then I was a professor in Indianapolis for a while, seven years where I started a data collection system there to track overdose deaths. And as you can see here, you know the bars in the back represent the number of overdose deaths. Uh, the line or the, the lines of the proportion of substances detected in those deaths, but you can see um, Indianapolis, like much of the United States, uh, fentanyl is driving overdose deaths there. But I wanted to go beyond just like mapping where overdose deaths were occurring and start to use this information to identify touch points. So these are essentially points that preceded a person's death um, to where we could have intervened. And so recently researchers have started to um, record link large administrative data sets with death records to identify these touch points. And so I got involved in some of that research. We looked at EMS as a touch point, um, naloxone by EMS, uh, prescription drug monitoring programs as a touch point. But the study that really impacted me was when we looked at incarceration in the county jail. And we designed this as a cohort study. So we were looking at everybody released from the county jail in the year 2017. And as you can see here, among all of the overdose deaths in Indianapolis in the year 2017, 21% of them were people who left that were part of that 2017 jail release cohort. In 2018, 20% of all of the overdose deaths that year were people from that 2017 jail release cohort. And in 2019, 22% of all the overdose deaths were people in that 2017 jail release cohort. So we provided this really conservative estimate that at least one out of five overdose deaths in the community are persons who uh, were recently released from the jail. And so this line of research eventually led me to do uh, training and technical assistance work um, with a group out of Wayne State University, where we were working to implement medications for opioid use disorder across uh, several jail facilities in Michigan. This group called the Opioid Treatment Ecosystem was trying to expand all forms of medication and offer um, MOUD to all persons with opioid use disorder that were coming through the facility. And so to facilitate this, we would create these uh, cascade of care figures. And these would help the stakeholders to identify where there were gaps in screening and medication. But after a while, when we were able to kind of step back and look at this data, one of the things that we realized is that many of those with an opioid use disorder are released from the facility before medications can be provided or induced. And you can see here more than half of those who screen positive for an OUD using the rods um, were released within 48 hours um, and 28% were released within the same day. So this does not negate the fact that all detainees with any behavioral health or other disabilities should have access to evidence-based treatment while they're incarcerated. Uh, but it does mean that the churn of jail facilities can make it hard to induce these medications. So we wanted to figure out how overdose prevention efforts could supplement or complement these um, treatment efforts. So really just did a deep dive into the internet, looking for innovative programming out there, and then identified um, these, these news stories from LA County. Uh, we found that these were the first to implement uh, vending machines that distributed free naloxone in jails. There were some news stories out there and some reports on these efforts that we could share with the jail facilities that we were currently working with. Um, but then we were actually able to talk to that team out in LA, which was great. And after we heard about their successes, we wanted to scale this up to multiple facilities, jail facilities in Michigan. And we had funding uh, from the CDC Overdose Data Action um, Grant in Michigan to do that. So 
in Michigan, you know, naloxone wasn't going to be an issue because uh, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and DHHS, they built this really and have it still operating this really incredible online portal uh, where agencies can go and order naloxone for free. So we just really needed to supply the machines and facilitate that implementation. But I will say that very early on, uh, I was shocked uh, at the criticism that I received of this even as an idea. Some of the criticism was just by really uninformed folks that were concerned that we might be uh, equating naloxone with candy or generating too much trash. And for those folks, you would just have to remind them of the dangers of sugar and the safety of naloxone and say, you know, we can buy trash cans. But others of, uh, of folks saw this as some sort of mission creep, like we were there to implement screening or we were there funded to implement medications, not naloxone. And for those folks, it did take quite a bit of discussion to get them to see that this focus on treatment in jails uh, is really, um, and all this funding around treatment in jails is really because we are in the middle of an overdose crisis. An overdose is the leading cause of death among returning citizens. So we just felt from the evidence that treatment alone was not doing enough to address that and really wanted to focus on getting overdose prevention into these facilities as well. So persistence uh, uh, prevailed and I ended up designing two machines with Marty Turner at Schaefer Distributing in Livonia, Michigan. Here's some of the specs on those two machines. And when we say customization of them, it's really about the coils in these machines. So one of them is set up for the standard uh, naloxone boxes. Um, so you can have 150 kits in those. And then the other, the second machine is designed so that if you were to take those kits out and put them into these packets, you could actually fit 600 doses in there this, that way. Uh, we did talk to persons who use drugs to get some feedback on what we should do in terms of cost mechanisms. But you'll notice that on these machines, there's no card, no code, no cash, and it actually says free. So we had the, the cost mechanism removed so that it would say free on there. Once the machines were designed, the TA providers would contact the jails that we were working with to figure out if or how they were currently distributing naloxone. And then they would pitch this idea of um, the machine as a way to ease the burden on staff. So some of them might have been filling up discharge boxes regularly or uh, discharge bins or might have been uh, asking people, hey, do you want naloxone? We would just say this might be an easier way to get it to the detainees and other uh, individuals in the community. So then for the facilities that were interested, we would find an agency in their community that was already ordering the naloxone from that portal. And then we ideally an agency that they knew or familiar with. Um, and then we would order the machine to be placed in the facility. And at the time that we were ordering them, the machine cost was between $3,500 and $4,000. And that included the delivery and installation. And the reason that we decided to go with new machines was because that if a facility no longer wanted them, then Shaper Distributing would just come back and get them. We started in jails, but once we hit saturation there, we moved on to libraries, treatment facilities, and then harm reduction providers. And I will say the first harm reduction providers to implement one of these machines, Harm Reduction Michigan, I believe actually improved the idea quite a bit. Um, and so they're developing a guide for other agencies on how to customize other machines out there, vending machines, and as you saw, like newspaper machines, things like that, uh, to distribute naloxone. These are the groups that are currently implementing um, those machines from Schaefer Distributing. And one thing I just want to point out here is the, the various funding sources. So on the right there, the MDHHS and the efforts at Wayne State, th those were funded by um, uh, the CDC Overdose Data to Action. On the left there um, in Indiana, the funding is coming through uh, SAMHSA, through SOAR2 funding, and then that Regional Judicial Opioid Initiative, which is eight states, um, that is coming through BJA COSAP funding, the, the payment for those machines. In terms of facilitators, um, just going over some barriers and facilitators here, um, the jails that had previously received OUD education were much more likely to implement to so where we were already doing some TA and they had already uh, implemented MOUD and things like that. Uh, we did also find that working through agencies involved in statewide efforts were better to, uh, able to identify where those jails were, were situated, jails that were likely to implement. So the individual doing this for the RJOY, Tara Blair, she was originally just cold calling places and mentioned, you know, once she um, got a hold of the HEAL group and the JCoin group, they were able to say, like, here's the facilities that you should look at. So we found that really beneficial. Um, media stories were also facilitators. So jails are run by sheriffs. Sheriffs are elected officials that like good press. Um, and so as media stories would come out, we could share those with sheriffs in other counties, and that seemed uh, to help. And then a final facilitator that I'll mention here is 
going through the uh, existing naloxone distribution channel seem to have worked well. So, you know, for example, with NDHHS, we could go through that online portal to identify naloxone distributors. And then with like Indiana, for example, um, Overdose Lifeline manages uh, much of the naloxone distribution for the state. So they were able to identify facilities and then oversee the uh, implementation and restocking of those. I've already mentioned a couple of the barriers. I mean, stigma was by far the most prevalent. Uh, sometimes this was directed at people who use drugs. Uh, other times it was really just a lack of understanding about how naloxone works. Um, there were some facilities that had legal concerns, but I will say that once we talked about the support coming from the state and that it was federal funding that really helped to alleviate those, but there have definitely been some states where we have been un unable to implement this um, uh, largely because of that barrier around training and also data collection for anybody that is uh, receiving naloxone. We found that as a barrier. A final barrier that I will mention, and this was a concern that we heard from individuals stocking the agencies, were just the ongoing sustainability and funding for naloxone, um, whether or not that would continue to be there, uh, but also, you know, questions around how to prioritize these machines uh, when there are instances of uh, shortages, naloxone shortages. So throughout all of this uh, vending machine work over the past uh, couple of years now, I think uh, throughout all of this, I've been asking, you know, where's the research and all this? But to me, this has really just been a, a very much of a technical assistance project. Uh, however, in an effort to try and generate some research or evidence around what's been done, I've uh, worked with my old colleagues from Wayne State University uh, to look at some of the data from the six sites where the machines were implemented. And so you can see on the right, the six Facilities listed there and in parentheses, those are the number of jail beds in each of those facilities. And the data that are displayed here come from that NDHHS uh, online portal. Uh, the bar charts show the change in the total and average number of kits ordered by the agencies. Uh, the stocking machine, the uh, agency stocking these machines six months before and after they implemented a vending machine. So note, this is all of the naloxone ordered by those agencies through the portal, not just the naloxone for the vending machines. Uh, but on the right, you can see the change in the total and average number of kits um, by facility, by jail facility. And what the data seem to suggest is that there are increases in naloxone distribution among those agencies stocking vending machines in larger jail facilities. And there was less of an increase or no increase in some of the smaller facilities. And, you know, while this does not speak to naloxone use by returning citizens, it does suggest that uh, vending machines might be an equitable means of increasing naloxone distribution uh, for agencies serving justice involved populations. So I will now turn this over to Jessica and Chelsea. Uh, thanks so much, Brad. Um, Chelsea, I'm gonna get the screen share up for us. Okay. Sounds great. I just confirm me all can see this. Wonderful, yes. great, thank you so much. Um, uh, good morning from the West Coast, Southwest. Um, uh, I'm uh, Jessica Johnson, um, and I get to collaborate with Chelsea Cheatham on the Public Health Funding Project in Nevada. Chelsea, anything to get us started, or are you ready to go? No, I think we're ready to go. Wonderful. Um, here's a brief overview of what uh, Chelsea and I uh, plan to cover today, and then really excited to hear the questions from all the folks on the call. Uh, so as a uh, background, uh, we know that U.S. drug overdoses surpassed 100,000 deaths in a single year of 2020. Um, and for these overdoses, the most documented route of administration was injection. Um, and in addition to increasing overdose deaths, injection drug use has been documented as the leading risk factor for hepatitis C, which has led to an increase in um, hepatitis C incidence, specifically among young adults aged 20 to 39. Um, the research also uh, suggests that HIV co-infection is more common among uh, people who inject drugs. So to address um, opioid overdose um, and other adverse health outcomes among people who use or inject drugs, the field really calls for access to harm reduction services, evidence-based, cost-effective, person-centered frontline services that mitigate these harms, of, um, can mitigate some of the harms of substance use. And one example of these is syringe services programs, um, which uh, Chelsea will happily tell you more about track these sort of broad work in this space. Um, and maybe many of you on the call today do work in syringe services programs. And the evidence is really clear on the effectiveness of syringe services programs. Um, however, 
we know that perhaps as many as 30 or 40 percent of folks um, who inject drugs are not currently accessing syringe services programs, which really creates this opportunity to expand and diversify um, syringe access and access to all types of harm reduction uh, supplies at new locations, such as uh, public health vending machines, pharmacies, and other areas. So I'll briefly highlight um, Nevada's uh, thinking behind this conceptual model and um, under the leadership of Traxi. So uh, really vending is kind of, you know, a, a new way, at least for the U.S., to tackle sort of um, ongoing issues um, that we're seeing in our community. Uh, in Clark County, we're very, like, broad and spread out um, across the whole county, and so we knew that one storefront or one uh, brick-and-mortar location wouldn't be enough um, uh, services to expand across the whole community. So really, uh, vending machines were a way to reduce uh, the operating costs of brick-and-mortar locations, but expand services um, for people across the community. Uh, vending allowed us uh, to partner with like-missioned agencies, so folks across the community who were already serving um, folks who were using or injecting drugs or who could benefit from harm reduction services. And um, it also allowed an opportunity to maybe um, reach people who might be resistant or um, not know about um, other types of services. We also hope that machines are reducing stigma in the community. Um, folks can access them without um, uh, experiencing, you know, discreetly um, for supplies that are needed. Um, and also um, perhaps reaching non-traditional populations, folks who might not otherwise access a storefront or um, attend uh, one of the mobile outreach services or whatever else. So um, really uh, for us, this was sort of the, the thinking behind setting this up. I'll turn over to Chelsea to talk about Track B. All right, thank you, Jessica. So Track B Exchange offers harm reduction products. We offer education and linkage to care as well as HIV and hepatitis C testing. I mean, we do this in a variety of ways. So the first um, way that we started offering these services was through our storefront. We opened in February of 2017. Um, the storefront syringe access program is open six days a week and it's been a really great way for us to offer those services that are best done in person, like the overdose prevention education. Um, we have the access to a mass spectrometer so we can let people know what's in the substances they're using. Um, things that are really helping to reduce overdose. Um, we have our shipping services. Uh, we were originally given a grant by the state of Nevada, but that's turned into just um, track B funds that are paying for this. And we're able to ship uh, Narcan as well as syringes throughout the entire state of Nevada. And that's helped us to lessen the number of people that are coming to the storefront, particularly during, during the COVID-19 um, outbreak. We have a mobile outreach and that distribution is done by our outreach team a few times a week in an outreach van. Um, we also were at one point doing mobile um, treatment for with mat treatment and we we're able to travel throughout the state of Nevada and meet with people um, in different offices to offer them mat treatment. Um, we have a wellness clinic that's located right next door to the storefront. Um, we have peer services where peers or people with lived experience are working with clients to help link them to care. Our peers are also into emergency rooms in the state of Nevada, 24 hours a day, seven days a week to link people to care. And we are doing really informal secondary exchange services for people that can't come to our location. Um, they're able to get some supplies from friends. And then vending, which is the program that I know everybody's here to hear about. So we're going to kind of dive a little bit deeper into that. So next, I'm going to talk about just kind of the, the history of the vending project. So this project actually started in Nevada in about 2007. Um, some formative research was being done at the Southern Nevada Health District um, by Rick Reich, who is the person that started Track B Exchange, as well as um, uh, some other people at the health district that were working in the HIV program. And really it started as a way to distribute condoms um, very easily in the community. And it really it started turning into more of a, looking at this through a syringe vending lens after they started finding that other countries such as Australia and New Zealand were actually being able to, to distribute syringes this way. So in 2012, they started doing an analysis of the utility of vending machines in non-traditional venues. 
2016, there were plans made to launch Track B, and the first three machines were purchased. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our first the syringe exchange opened in 2017, and the machines came out about three months after the exchange opened. So um, it, it was a really fast process um, once everything started rolling. And then in 2020, we um, rolled out the first vending machine that's located outside of Clark County, which is in Hawthorne, Nevada. It's about five hours away from Clark County, and we'll talk about that a little more later. Okay, so some of the locations of the vending machines include addiction treatment centers, um, community centers, primary care clinics, and then our outdoor location, which is the only outdoor machine, which is in Hawthorne, our, our rural location. Um, originally, we had eight vending machines. We now only have five that are currently active. Um, it, it definitely goes up and down. It really changes if an organization feels that the machine is not um, a benefit to them, or if we find that an, a location is not really the best space to have a vending machine. And that's one of the things that you'll find when you start kind of rolling out your vending programs, if that's something that your community is going to do is, you know, it really is trial and error. You're gonna place a vending machine and you may, you may find that nobody uses it. Um, or you may have too much use at a vending machine and it's really an issue for the site where it's placed. So um, you're gonna kind of go up and down, but right now we have five that are currently available to the community. So some of the products that are in the vending machines include syringe kits, which um, we started off with having a syringe kit that had 10 syringes in it. After kind of going back and talking to people that were using the machine, we've kind of upped that to 30 um, in, in each kit with all of the things that people need to safely inject. So they do include the cottons, the cookers, sterile water, tourniquets, band-aids. Um, all of these things are allowed through our Nevada revised statutes. So um, we were lucky that our, our state had made this possible through the changes in laws. Um, we also have hormone injection kits, which include um, syringes that are in a larger gauge to make it easier to inject some, um, some different substances. Um, we have safe sex kits, which are condoms and lube, wound care, hygiene kits, um, emergency contraception is something that we're able to give out through the machines, um, extra sharps containers, which you can see in the picture, those little black um, containers, which are easy for people to carry in their pockets, which makes disposal so much easier. Um, and then also naloxone is able to be distributed to people that are using, um, that are actively using opioids through this machine. Okay, so we are gonna kind of dive into sign up. So um, sign up is something that we do to really ensure that we're able to keep the machine stocked. Um, we had considered at one point just making the machine easily accessible to everybody where you would just be able to access anything out of the machine and we realized really quickly that that was not a possibility that those machines would be drained really quickly. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the items in the machine, including syringes, do have a street value um, for people that um, are, are looking to make some money. So we created this sign up where people are able to provide us with very basic information. And that information includes the first two letters of your first name, first two letters of your last name, your zip code, et cetera. And we're able to provide them with a unique ID number that they can use at any of the machines that are in the state. Um, they're also provided with a swipe card, which is a magnetic swipe card that they can use at the machine. And um, all of the products in the machine have no cost to them. So this is really just a way for us to do inventory control and to ensure that everybody has access to getting the supplies out of the machine. Um, there's also an online sign up form for people to sign up online if they're not able to come into the office to sign up. All of the items in the machine are pre-programmed to dispense only a certain amount. So there are limits. So having the unique ID in the swipe card allows us to, to monitor how often people are needing to use the machine. And it also allows us to limit how often people are able to get supplies. So with data management, um, there are several different systems that people can use with vending machines for data management. I mean, you can go as um, kind of really simple, like using an Excel sheet. We have one that's built into our vending machines and it's called Vendovation. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about the cost to this, but 
Um, it's a system that manages the transactions um, in the machine and it also helps to communicate inventory. Um, we're able to look at this system once a day and we can see if a machine needs to get filled. Um, and also it utilizes, it creates reports on utilization so that we can see how many items are going out of the machine. It makes it really easy for data reporting for grants and also for presentations. Um, right now there's a lot of research being done on the machine, so it's really made it easy for us to be able to get that information to people that need it. Disposal was always one of our um, our major purposes when we opened the storefront syringe exchange, and we didn't want that to change with the vending machines. We want to make sure that there's no syringe waste in the community. So next to every single vending machine, there's a sharps container. You can see it in that picture. It's large and it's actually kind of similar to a bear box that you find at a camping site. Um, it's lockable so people cannot go in there and take anything out of it but people are able to discard all of their used sharps in those sharps containers that you saw earlier um, and drop them in this large sharps bin and they're able to get their new sharps. We collect all of those used sharps out of the sharps bin and we bring them to our office where we have a sterilis machine that you can see in the photo. Um, it's an autoclave where you can put all of those little black sharps containers in, it will um, sterilize everything and then the bottom drops out and it grinds it up into that confetti that you can see in the picture. So it's sterilized medical waste, it can go right in the garbage. That's saved us a lot of money when it comes to disposal of syringes and also it's helped to really make it where we have not seen any syringe waste in Clark County or really throughout the um, state where we've had vending. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about implementation in urban areas, and then after this, we'll talk about implementation in our rural county. It's really different. So Clark County is the 11th most populous county in the United States, and 74% of the population of the state of Nevada lives in Clark County. So we are really, really large county. Um, in order to really get this started, we started with participant surveys. So we did seed surveys where we met with people, and this was through the Southern Nevada Health District. We met with people who admitted to injecting um, substances and had them bring in friends where we were able to survey to figure out which areas may benefit exchange, as well as to find out what products people wanted. Um, it helped us to not be able to, um, to really not waste time and money in the implementation stages. Also, we did some research in other areas. We had conversations with Puerto Rico, who had vending machines for many, many years before Nevada did, um, as well as, you know, just research on other countries that had vending machines. Um, we talked to businesses that were places where we felt machines could be placed to really talk to find out about machine acceptance. And then we um, purchased those first three vending machines with funds from a nonprofit that closed and then we had to design the machines and figure out exactly how the, the coils were going to be, how many um, rows we were going to have designing the wrap, and then also planning for delivery, um, which when we um, planned for delivery, we actually had the machines delivered to our health department. So um, it just made it a lot easier since we were a really tiny agency and we didn't have a place where we could deliver the machines um, to get them set up. So implementation in rural areas. Um, so we have one machine that's located in a rural area. It's in Hawthorne, Nevada, which is about five hours away from our office in Las Vegas. That implementation was very, very different than working in Clark County. Um, working in an urban area, you're really able to kind of get things done without a lot of people knowing. So it really was, um, you know, we we made sure that people who needed to know knew. In a small area, you don't have that luxury. Um, everybody in the community is gonna know if you place a vending machine, everybody's gonna you know, really be able to see who's using the machine. So we wanted to make sure we took those things into consideration. So we worked with some local champions. We worked with the Prevention Coalition that's located in Hawthorne, and they were able to help us figure out a location for the machine and also figure out products. Um, and they helped us find people that were able to stock the machine as well. Um, we had listening sessions with the community. Uh, we had two listening sessions where we just had it available for people in the community to come out and talk to us and, and really ask those important questions about, 
you know, syringe waste and is it going to encourage more people to use needles and, you know, are are minors going to be able to access the machines? Those important questions that communities have, they were able to ask and they were able to get answers, which helped us not have a lot of opposition when we started working with law enforcement. So in our rural communities, we do try to get law enforcement buy-in and we've had some really unlikely champions in law enforcement um, with local county sheriffs that are signing on and saying that they're accepting of this project and really um, going to city councils and um, county commission meetings and being in favor of this project. Some of the limitations that you're going to have in rural areas is your data. A lot of times if um, you don't have a large population, you may not know how many people are using syringes or even using opioids. Um, so you may be looking at comparing urban data and trying to make it work for a rural area, which might be a little more difficult, but that's where working with those local champions helps. Next slide, Jess. Next slide, thanks. Oh, sorry, did it move? The day-to-day -day operation? It moved, yep. Yep, okay, thank you. Um, okay, so day-to-day -day operations. So things that you wanna take into consideration when you place these vending machines is they are gonna sometimes um, need maintenance. So you wanna have someone on staff that's gonna be a little bit um, able to, to, you know, maintain the machines. They aren't very difficult. They're not very um, complicated, but you may have to change, you know, wires or things like that yourself, fix coils, fix batteries, uh, or sorry, uh, motors you are going to have to have staff that are going to be able to pack kits, fill the machine, help with sign up, help people who've maybe forgotten their unique ID number and lost their card. Um, you, you may have to troubleshoot some tech issues sometimes where machines aren't dispensing correctly. Um, and that's kind of where it's very helpful to have um, a, a data system or a group that's working on the vending machines like we have with Vendovation that can really help us troubleshoot some of those tech issues. Um, since we don't have an IT department at our harm reduction center, it's a tiny little organization. Um, we have um, sometimes we have to double check to make sure people aren't getting duplicate cards. And that does take a little bit of time when people are signing up to, to go through and make sure that they are only getting one card. And then you're going to have to always think about the costs. So these machines the, that we purchased cost about $10,000 each, plus the data system is about $1,200 a year. So there is kind of that ongoing cost and the cost for kits is gonna be about $4 per kit if you're putting the sharps containers, the syringes, all of that stuff in there. Um, we're lucky we get a lot of our um, safe sex kits and our naloxone for free through the state of Nevada. So um, there may be some costs just based on what your organization or your jurisdiction is willing to pay for. Um, Chelsea, I'm going to skip this slide in the interest of time and let you talk a little bit about um, utilization. Sure. Okay. All right. So with utilization, um, I just pulled the data for um, 2021 just because we wanted to show really what it's going to look like in a year. Um, and this data is for all of the machines that were out. And I believe we at that time we had seven machines in 2021. So there are about 8,000 vending transactions that year. It's 167,110 syringes, so lots of syringes. Um, in Nevada, syringes, we don't have any funds for syringes, so that is a cost that is on the harm reduction center solely. Um, and then you can kind of see there some of the other transactions that were done. Um, 237 pregnancy tests, 500 syringe kits, 773 first aid um, or wound care kits. Um, I can talk a little bit about some of the successes. So, um, uh, and Chelsea, feel free to hop in. So really um, the partnership between the local syringe services program and the health department, um, not, we're, not just because we're here today, but um, this has been a, a great way and an opportunity for our health department to be champions and advocates for um, the great work that uh, Track B has been uh, doing. Um, they've been able to grow the program throughout the past five years um, within uh, our community uh, modified product packaging to help reduce costs. So we're happy to talk about all of these things in Q&A more in depth as well, um, including the creation of an online sign-up system that we're getting ready to roll out at the first um, off-site location. 
Chelsea mentioned um, the first outdoor and 24 hour vending location. And then together, um, we provide uh, technical assistance to many jurisdictions across um, the U.S. Here's a little bit more information on um, some of the impact and expansion. So if you're interested after the call today um, to join the Public Health Vending Collaborative, or um, if this group has a, a separate collaborative, happy to, to work directly with them. Um, this has been a bi-monthly call. Um, on the third Tuesday of every other month, we have about 55 to 60 attendees across the U.S. Um, that join. And um, really, it's an opportunity to discuss current implementation, brainstorm challenges. I listed some of the ideas on adaptability that we're seeing across the U.S. So people are talking about products and locations and how to manage sign up and um, what companies they're going through, how they're dealing with trainings, if they have a centralized system where, um, as Chelsea described, sort of one agency is working with all of these other folks, or if it's more decentralized where they're funding groups to stand up vending um, and kind of brainstorming around um, laws and model laws and policies um, that might be facilitators or barriers in some of their work. If you're interested in joining, please feel free to shoot me an email. Um, I'm happy to add you um, or your colleagues to the mailing list. And I think that's it from us. Chelsea, um, great job in sharing, and we'd love to take questions and go more in depth than any of this um, during the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you both. And um, Derek, now we'll turn it back to you uh, to talk a little bit about the law enforcement perspective on these vending machines, especially around um, naloxone vending. Yeah, thank you, April. Um, so I'm Derek Jackson. I'm the director at a place called the Washington County Sheriff's Office. It's in Southeast Michigan. Uh, University of Michigan Ann Arbor is our uh, kind of home base. Um, and I'm a social worker, like April said, who became a police officer. So I know I have a unique perspective, but hopefully what I can do is just share um, a couple of ideas of how you may engage your local law enforcement partners, or if you are law enforcement on the call, um, how we thought about in, um, doing this work in the process that we use. One of the things I often say is, um, uh, and this is a paradigm shift for many people, but the most vulnerable of the vulnerable populations are tied up within the criminal legal system. And so to my social work counterparts, I often um, will talk to them because when I was going through school, we didn't necessarily think about that, right? We think about um, these populations we want to help around addiction, around homelessness, around mental health. But it's unfortunate to say this, but all over the country, the jails are full of people who are struggling with addiction, homelessness, and mental illness. And so I think it is a part of our values and our code is like calling us. Um, and even if you're not a social worker on the call, if you're doing this work, it's really imploring you to get engaged with uh, the criminal legal system in some way. Because if you care about addiction, um, the most vulnerable of the vulnerable uh, who are um, living with active addiction are tied up in the criminal justice system many times. So this work, I think, is really, really important. So I just wanted to start with that from a paradigm perspective, because I think that's how you can also um, talk to some of your local law enforcement agencies around this work. Um, I'll just take you to the process that we started with. So by the time we came to a vending machine, um, we didn't really get any pushback in our community, but that's because we have been doing years of work in other areas. So I just want to mention some of those. Uh, we hire an outreach team of community members with lived experience. Uh, many of them are in uh, recovery now. Um, some have come through our jail, been in prison, um, who literally work for the sheriff's office. So they're our street outreach team. And they aren't informants. They don't sweep our floors. They're experts on community. And so our first um, kind of foray into understanding the lock zone was through individuals who worked at our agency who brought this to our attention. Our next step was equipping our deputies uh, on the road, because we also have road patrol at our sheriff's office uh, with naloxone. And so that was a little bit of a tricky conversation years ago, because not a lot of people were carrying naloxone. But I do think some of the things that we were able to do and how we talked about it with officers, I literally looked at the number of overdose deaths that we had from our deputies responding, started talking to the deputies and asking them, the folks who had been on scene um, and, and hearing their stories. And deputy after deputy didn't understand the lock zone, didn't really know a lot about recovery and the stigma associated with recovery work uh, or addiction work. But what they knew was it felt horrible to be an officer that did not have anything they could do when someone was overdosing in front of them. 
That was my end. And so then we started talking about this thing called naloxone. Well, what if I could give you this tool that you could save someone's life? And there were mixed emotions about it. Like, why would we help people who want to use? But we started to break that down by bringing in folks who have that lived experience, people who re, uh, are in long-term recovery. And so now you start to destigmatize. One of the other things I would offer if you are thinking about or struggling with how do you get your local law enforcement partner and the folks running your jail on board is, who is that internal champion? Who is that person? Maybe you don't have a social worker like Derek running the agency, but what you might have is someone who has some lived experience where a loved one um, has really struggled with addiction. Um, in our case, our commander at the time, um, her daughter, who many of our officers knew and kind of watched grow up, um, who they knew and loved, um, she really struggled. And together, our commander and her daughter publicly shared their story to our staff. And so it made it real to many of them to be able to say, well, hey, you know her. Like, she's not just some horrible person. Like, she's someone with an illness that's struggling. So I offer those as just some ways in which we started talking about um, addiction work to our officers that then led us to be able to um, implement a couple of other pieces. So I want to mention them. Um, we then started having our corrections officers because they were asking us in the jail, what can we do around the lock zone? So now if someone uh, asks for it and requests it, our COs will put naloxone into the property bags of individuals. And here's how we got them to really buy into it. Just like I did with the deputies and asking them about their stories, we don't often think about it, but corrections officers spend a lot of time with people who are incarcerated. It's interesting, but they develop real relationships with people who are incarcerated. They're seeing them every day, eight, 10, 12 hours. And when someone gets out and you think about Brad's data, the number of people who get out, go right back to using at the rate that they were prior to incarceration and they overdose, there were COs who were recognizing that they were losing people that they had a relationship with. And again, using those stories in our trainings allow for it to really make sense for our COs who didn't quite understand uh, recovery and harm reduction and addiction. We didn't have a medically assisted treatment in our jail, so I won't go into all that, but you guys know what that work is. So by the time we came to vending machines earlier this year, it was a no brainer for us. Um, the biggest questions for us uh, was size. Where can we physically put this large machine? Um, and it was also around, um, we wanted it to be discreet. We didn't wanna cause more stigma where people thought like just by going to the machine that maybe um, folks would identify who's struggling with addiction at the time. So we in our county, um, community corrections or all of our alternatives to incarceration, drug testing, tether and all that is a part of our sheriff's office. So in what we call our reentry center on our main campus, um, we have our outreach team, our work program, and a lot of these alternatives to incarceration. One of the busiest lobbies we have in our county is that building. So we put our vending machine in that facility down one of our hallways. Um, and I'll just say, I was even surprised at the rate of use. And how I measure the rate of use just from the beginning is as I walk by it every day to go to my office, I just see how many naloxone kits has been taken. Um, and so our deputies have already saved 325 lives since we've given them naloxone in their hands. And we've already had to refill our machine. I think we only had it for about four to five months. Um, and we had to refill, uh, we have one of the larger machines. We have had to refill it because it was almost totally empty. The way that we refill ours, um, because we are here in Michigan, as Brad said, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, um, anyone who requests naloxone, an organization like us can get it for free. So one of our directors, um, with the help of some of the staff, just manages how many naloxone kits do we need in our jail to put in people's property bags, and how many do we need to refill our vending machine. Um, and so there's not a cost for us as an agency, and there were just a couple of extra steps added to people's jobs to really monitor it and then um, put in the request to, to refill it. Um, we did have people ask the question, um, you know, by having this vending machine at a sheriff's office, are we gonna be arresting people? Um, we did a lot of work early on to really just talk to uh, people who were in active addiction and say like, listen, if you call 911 um, and you're with someone who's overdosing, uh, we're not gonna arrest you. You're not gonna be in trouble, right? Like do the right thing and make that call. So some of this around our vending machine was an extension of those conversations we were already having. 
Um, I will say this because uh, I think it's really important. We are in one of the more uh, politically liberal counties in Michigan, the most liberal. Um, and so um, harm reduction isn't something we do well, but politically there wasn't a lot of pushback from some of our higher ups to say like, this is wrong, you shouldn't do this. So I know that's not the reality for a lot of my counterparts around the country. Um, so I just wanted to mention that, that um, um, I know that in the community that I'm in, some of this was a little bit more easily accepted, but I wanna tell you, that we had jurisdictions who banned needle exchange programs in our county. We've had people who literally asked us the question, like, aren't you just enabling people? So even in a community like ours, um, there was some pushback um, in the very, very beginning. Um, so, so I'll end there to, to be happy to answer any questions and I see some things in the chat that are popping up, but I just wanted to offer um, some real life examples of how you might implement this in your community and any um, law enforcement agency that's out there or any chief or sheriff who you might come in contact with who may be questioning it, I am always phone call or an email away and happy to talk to any others um, about what our experience has been um, and how it really has helped to save lives um, and make our community better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Derek. And before we open it up to general questions, I wanted to follow up on your comments about where you placed uh, the vending machines within the facility and you talked about walking by them to see how many um, units have been vended as sort of a way to monitor demand and and supply were um, units accessible to family members visiting the facilities in addition to those who were um, being released from incarceration or or being involved with the sheriff's office or whatnot i see brad nodding too so maybe you can weigh in on access among family members after derek yeah, so in, in our location, yeah, and then we thought a lot about that. We wanted anyone to be able to come in. So that particular building, like we said, we call it the reentry center. There are lots of families. We do a lot of groups in there. A lot of outside human service providers use that facility for like after hour groups. So it has become um, in some ways a hub. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so it is accessible. Um, the It's in our building. So when the building is locked at night, um, it's not accessible in our case. Uh, but it is accessible during working normal working hours um, uh, for us. I'll just say that all the machines that I showed that data on were also in places where detainees and the general public could access them that came into the jail. And related to that, did you find that the the jails became a hub of activity and foot traffic as a result of those machines being placed? There. It's a great question. I, I should have mentioned this. I, I'll be on. I work with a lot of people who have criminal history uh, or, or, you know, lived experience. None of them are coming to the sheriff's office. Um, that, uh, like that's not where they want to hang out. Right. Like even the folks who work for us, um, if I put on a uniform for a day, they kind of like there. And so, you know, it's like a, a shake up. So I, I, I'm joking, but in all seriousness, it has not created like a line of people who are coming through. What it has done for us, though, is for those people who are already coming because they're court ordered to drug tests, for those who are already participating in groups, a lot of them in um, recovery, um, it has put another tool in our tool belt, but also in their hands uh, should they need it. So our hope and our thought is um, if I'm someone who's in recovery and I grab this or I'm a family member of someone who's in active addiction or recovery and I have this with me in my car, my purse, whatever it may be, that if someone overdoses, I have the ability to save a life. And for us, common denominator for everything, our officers, people who don't understand this work, whatever it may be, we come back to saving someone's life. Um, and I think that core nugget right there has allowed some people who don't quite understand it to be like, okay, I can at least get with the program on, this is just one tool to save a life. Yeah, thank you. We had a, a comment come in in the chat from Phoebe. Uh, Phoebe asked, when an individual registers online for access to the harm reduction vending machine, are they required to be trained via video sessions on the signs and symptoms of opioid overdose? Um, in Kentucky, it is required that there be some, some training um, before naloxone can be dispensed. I think it's clear from the policy that the intent from the state and others is that we make that as low barrier as possible and how that training occurs is up to the person signing the standing order agreement 
for the naloxone. So it can be quite simple or it can be quite complicated depending on the provider's um, standing order. So Chelsea and Jessica, maybe you can speak to your experience with trainings. And I think Brad, you've, um, you've had experience with this too about how to do the education piece. So Chelsea, we can start with you. Sure, yes. So at, at the storefront, we do offer um, in-person opioid trainings, overdose trainings. Um, the majority of people that are signing up to use our vending machines have met our staff at the storefront on outreach or in other places where they're able to receive the trainings. Um, also, the Southern Nevada Health District created some um, handouts for us that are really tiny foldable that go with the kits that have information on how to recognize an overdose. Um, so those are vended at the machine, uh, but there is no training via video at the vending machine. It's a great idea though. Yeah, to add to what Chelsea said, um, as we um, really think about the expansion of the online signup, we've discussed like opportunities for people to access videos and all, I mean, really the sky's the limit in that regard. And then when people are handed their cards, they're sort of um, often done a brief walkthrough of the products that are in the machine and um, kind of discuss, um, you know, what they might be accessing and then any either site or other um, uh, uh, policies or things that they should be aware of um, when accessing uh, products on site. Um, additionally, uh, it, we've offered Harm Reduction 101, um, drug-related stigma, and other trainings to each of the host sites, um, including uh, we're expanding at the health department. So I've really been um, training and advocating internally for what people might need to know um, during the sign-up process and making sure they have what they need. Yeah, I'll mention there is at least one study that shows that people who are trained in naloxone are actually no better able to use it than those who aren't. And I'm not saying that to say I'm against naloxone training at all. I just think communities need to ask the question when they're doing this, does this, does this population that we're trying to get naloxone to, do they need training or is that just going to be a barrier? So when I first introduced this idea, I was told anybody who got naloxone in the state of Michigan was required to go through training. And I just went to a pharmacy with some money. And uh, as somebody just mentioned in the chat, I just went to the pharmacy, bought naloxone, uh, came back on a Zoom call and showed folks, guess who just got naloxone without any training at all? If you have the money, uh, you don't need to get the training because as if you look in the instructions, there's plenty of training and information in there. So again, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be doing training, um, but I'm just saying it's something that community should question. And so what we ended up doing was putting a QR code. Again, I know a lot of the folks that are leaving jail facilities don't have access to the internet or phone, but this was a QR code that gave them access to where they could get more naloxone, how to use naloxone and get some training on it. And as we got rolling with it, the stoppers would end up doing their own information in there, their own training information, and that was much more localized. Um, so, yeah. Um, Thanks, Brad. Yeah, the QR codes with access to training, that's an um, a innovative idea. Another one that I've heard mentioned, I think it may have come from you, Brad, is that there was a, a one group that was running um, constant overdose education on a television uh, installed next to the machine. And so that was another approach that had been used that might be feasible for our probation and parole offices and jails and others in Kentucky. Several uh, other questions have come into the chat. Um, trying to keep up. <laughs> I think, let's see, um, I do want to raise up that Jody Jaggers did mention, to your point, Brad, that the Narcan boxes have, have information right under the front flap, uh, which is what you were just describing. Uh, Alina asked uh, for more detail on exactly where they are in the jail, the group rooms, cafeteria, dorms. I know others that have been mentioned are lobbies, booking rooms. Have there, are there any other places that you haven't mentioned already, Derek? You mentioned the hallway, the lobby. Yeah, so we don't physically have ours in our jail. Um, on our campus, we have a couple of different buildings. So literally right across the parking lot from the jail is where the reentry center is. And so ours is in that building. Um, uh, uh, so yeah, so we don't have ours like physically in the jail. We thought about putting it in our upstairs lobby of the jail, which is where visitation starts and happens. Um, but as our staff was kind of talking this through, it seemed like that was, at least for our setup, a little bit more limiting because it was only for the families who were coming. Uh, it, most of the people who are kind of in and out of our reentry center um, would not have access to that because they wouldn't see it regularly. So this one felt a little bit um, 
more open uh, than, than doing it in the lobby of the jail, which uh, seemed to be a little bit limiting. The other thing about the lobby of the jail, our, ours is connected to our court. And so you have like court security, like right next to our lobby. And so when we think about the discrete nature of it, that front lobby for our jail is very busy with visitors and um, COs are sitting there watching visitation and doing some of that. So it just didn't seem like a kind of discrete area where someone might feel comfortable just going up to the naloxone machine. But that's just in our physical setup. Right. And I'll just mention April and some of the other ones that they are in lobbies. So as soon as you walk in, you see those phones um, where people make calls or lockers where things are and there's a vending machine there. And one thing that did concern me about the lobbies is that that might not be the exit that detainees go out. So it might be that community members are getting it. Detainees might have to come back into the facility, which I'm sure they would not want to do. Um, but I think that it's a good question to ask, you know, where is the optimal location for these types of machines and so that the right groups are getting access to them. Yeah, thank you. And speaking to the issue of needing to stay discreet, I've, I've heard, I think from Chelsea in the past, you know, there's attention to the packaging being very discreet rather than screaming naloxone. I think you noticed on their pictures, it just says track B exchange. I've also heard from focus groups in Kentucky that they would like for um, food and water and wound care and other things to be um, vended that is not as stigmatizing so that when somebody is seen at the machine, they don't know if they're getting a bottle of water, if they're getting um, a tobacco quit kit, or if they're getting the locks on. That way it's very um, private. And that's especially important for the community-based machines. Um, while we're on the theme of, of talking about the gels and the locations of vending machines and whatnot, Carrie asked a question about how are data reporting requirements, like demographics, working in the vending machines that are located in these justice settings. And in Michigan, they're not collecting information on individual demographics that, that get information, that get naloxone from the machines. Um, some of the states have required that, and so we haven't been able to implement that. I think it's, I think it's West Virginia where we've had that difficulty. Uh, but in Michigan, it's not happening, and neither in Indiana. Thanks, Brad. And Kathleen um, asked, where we can find information about ordering the machines, both large and newspaper size. I think that's something we could put together in a handout and share with the group, with everyone on this call um, afterwards, because it, there's several different vendors. They range in cost. Some are much cheaper than the 10,000 Chelsea described, but they also have fewer features. So we can try to put together a handout for everyone. Other questions? One that I saw in the registration questions are uh, related to safety and vandalism. And I wanna ask Jessica and Chelsea about this. You have machines established in various locations, including outside. Um, have you had any issues with vandalism or theft or anything of that nature? We actually haven't. Um, so in the five years since we've had the vending machines, we haven't had any issues when it comes to vandalism. We've had to do minor repairs on the swipe card, um, the little plastic parts where the swipe card goes. And it's just, you know, probably people using it too much and breaking it, but no issues with anybody breaking in or graffiti. And I think one of the things that we, we planned from the beginning, and this was through talking to people that were potentially gonna use the machines in our focus groups, is the machines are wrapped. So it has kind of a graffiti wrap. So it is probably less likely in that case that anybody's gonna want to write on it or tag it or anything like that. If I can just add to that, um, I also think that uh, the packages are in um, sort of like opaque uh, covering. So really it's designed um, for the people who are using the machine uh, to, to know the products that are in there and what they want to access as there are a variety of products in these particular machines. Um, and uh, I think, and that was um, part intentional and part due to cost. Um, some of the boxes that we used at the beginning um, were costly. So um, being able to put them in the opaque um, bags also um, is easier for folks to transport coming to and from the machine rather than maybe a big bulky box that wouldn't fit in a backpack or a purse or some other um, item that folks might need. So just a few considerations um, around packaging and design and really talking with the community that you serve um, can help inform some of those decisions. Great point. I want to circle back to a comment that I overlooked as I was scrolling through about injectable 
um, naloxone and of course Cloxado is a newer product that you may not have experience with just yet, but um, have you all tried injectable naloxone in your machines? And what has the uptake been for that product? Because it is so much less expensive um, than, than the nasal product. I'll just mention none of the machines that Marty's designed to do the injectables. I mean, we could fit them in those kits, but it hasn't been done yet for the reason that MDHHS is paying for the intranasal naloxone in Michigan and Indiana already purchases the intranasal through um, uh, overdose lifeline. But I will say the harm reduction groups in Michigan that have started customizing those machines have been doing some of that um, injectable naloxone. Also, injectable naloxone, totally impossible in the state of Indiana. It's actually a felony to possess a syringe in the state of Indiana without a prescription. So that would be totally off the table. We have done injectable naloxone um, in Nevada and we switched to the nasal only because we were able to get it at no cost from our, from our state, but uh, we started off with injectable and we never had any issues with it. It was easy for people to use. Yeah, so it sounds like if you're able to get it for free, the, the intranasal version is preferred. Uh, and, but if you're not, then it would really cut costs to be able to use IM. Um, injectable naloxone. Another question came in. Um, education and information around Cluxado. Uh, yes, so we can also share that information with the group as well. Thanks, Keisha. Other questions or comments? It, not necessarily a question. I. I maybe you might prompt some questions. I'd be very curious though, if, if people are having that hard time interacting with their local you know, law enforcement or jail in that particular conversation and how to um, even start or begin that conversation. Um, and again, for us, it was, uh, I just didn't know about it. And it wasn't until people with lived experience could say, hey, have you guys even heard about this? This is what you should be thinking about. Um, and then having those real life lived experience conversations in partnership. But I know, again, that's not always an easy conversation to start with the, with the law enforcement agency. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. I, I'd be happy to talk uh, more about it or answer any questions around how to do that work. Um, but our process, I'll say again, has been a process. So it's not been, it wasn't an overnight thing. So it took us some time to get people to understand the value of naloxone. Um, we actually had another agency within our county who refused to carry naloxone. Um, we had already been carrying it at the county sheriff's office. And it wasn't until a young lady who was pregnant who overdosed and she died and the, and the baby was lost. Um, and then the community started asking, well, why didn't your officer have naloxone? It could have saved this baby's life, could have saved her life. And in some ways, publicly, it forced them to jump into this conversation. But prior to that, they weren't really willing to. So I know it's even in our community has been difficult to even start to have some of those uh, uh, conversations. So I just wanted to offer that up as a topic if people have specific questions or ideas about it. Yeah, thanks, Derek. And before I put our criminal justice um, team lead, Carrie, Oh, sir, if she's still on the call or Margaret and others that have worked with our jails um, to kind of provide some um, feedback on what they've heard when working with the jails and hearing about their attitudes toward uh, naloxone vending machines. I do just want to add about the resistance. Um, some of the language that we use around these machines can also help with resistance. So I've found among some um, folks in Kentucky that the term vending machine is a little cringy when it comes to talking about harm reduction supplies and naloxone, and that they really prefer a term like kiosk, a health kiosk, um, because it's a little more palatable. So um, I just wanted to throw that out there as one possible uh, language change that could potentially help with resistance. Brad, did you have a comment before I toss it to our justice team? And Jessica? I'll just mention that, you know, I've done a lot of work on training officers to have naloxone, but I think just by and large, you know, society wise, we need to start pushing that conversation to not just training officers to have naloxone, but to distribute naloxone. And that's kind of where I think we're, you know, somebody like Derek could be really helpful in those conversations. Because we've gotten to the point where, you know, a lot of jails have naloxone to save officers 
Um, and, and you know, police have naloxone, but it's how do we get those agencies to actively work on distributing it to individuals who need it and are likely to use it? And I think we should all be engaging in those conversations when we can. So, um, that's a great point, Brad. If I could just add um, to what you said and what Derek mentioned earlier. Um, uh, working with law enforcement, as Chelsea alluded to, is especially important in our rural communities where, um, uh, you know, when you're working in a one square mile town in rural Nevada, um, it's important, like really everyone, you know, has a say in, in what was going on. So it was helpful for us um, to talk with officers and say, you know, what would you need to know to move this program forward? And really, they wanted community to be informed. And so we hosted multiple town halls, community conversations brought, uh, and folks with lived experience were willing to come and, and talk about um, how vending machines um, would have impacted their journey, um, what it, you know, what it would be like to have this in the community. And, and for them, um, I wouldn't say that they, that most of them were like supportive, supportive, but they were like, we're not going to stand in the way of this project moving forward. And um, that was enough. That was enough for us. That was enough for the community members um, to want to move forward. So I think um, that opportunity um, to, to talk with folks and then we find at those town halls, people come in with one idea of what this uh, project is about and leave and tell us, I really learned something today. I learned something about my community. I learned something about additional resources and options um, for people um, who have substance use disorder or who are um, in, you know, active addiction and what those resources might be um, for our community. So uh, I do think that that's been a really beneficial and a key part of our process and in, in thinking about um, expansion across the state. And that it didn't happen overnight. Uh, the Hawthorne project started in 2018 and we didn't you know drive the machine out there until October of 2020 so I think as you think about capacity and sort of what it takes that um, particularly in locations that are new and novel um, it can take a minute um, to, to make sure everybody's ready yeah thanks Jessica and I think that resonates with the healing community study too because it's founded in community engagement and our criminal justice team had done quite a bit of work with our justice partners before um, we were presenting the opportunity. We had the opportunity to present the opportunity um, to the facilities to implement uh, um, these machines. Lucy, you mentioned that you were involved in the original project with Tara Blair and for the others who are on the call and don't know about this, they had um, the ability to offer some vending machines up to certain states and certain groups and that you experienced some real challenges. Would you be willing to share, Lucy, some of the comments you received, maybe anything unique that hasn't already been mentioned here? No, actually I've learned so much just from talking, just from listening to you all today. Uh, some of the objections that uh, the jails gave to us, uh, you answered in terms of um, inventory control and, and how would we uh, get that information and who would take charge of it. And the jails just didn't want that added responsibility. Uh, they're already overcrowded and um, facing a lot of challenges themselves. I think that, um, uh, what there was a huge difference as soon as uh, we we talked to heal and to, to healing communities and um, and those wave one counties those first counties where all the work has already been done they were absolutely ready uh, but I think you're really right that it it takes time you've got to have a champion you've got to um, the the groundwork. I, I, I tried in our the regional jail in my detention center in my area, and um, I got, we don't want a machine like that here. And it's because they, they the groundwork had not been done there. And I, so I really think that uh, you've got to make sure that that's in place before um, going too deeply with this or or you'll just hit roadblocks that could end up being detrimental even down the road. Yeah, thank like, you, Brad. Did you have something to add to? Yeah, just to add to what Lucy said about where communities are ready. I mean, there are a lot of universities, there are a lot of TTA providers, there are a lot of state governments that are implementing medications for opioid use disorder in county jails. 
And this is not beyond the scope of that. And I think that's that's another group that should be looking to have these conversations. It's not just about medications. Uh, naloxone can help to reduce overdose in the community. So really encouraging those groups that are already doing this work, as Lucy mentioned, to bring up this conversation uh, with the facilities they're working with. Yeah, thank you, Brad. And in Kentucky, we've had almost the opposite experience where medications for opioid use disorder are not being offered in the jails. And, but our work with the jails and others around naloxone is paving the way for conversations about medications for opioid use disorder. Um, and so I think it can go, it can go both ways. Um, Carrie, if you're still on the call or Margaret and others who've worked with the jails and um, justice facilities in Kentucky, have there been other challenges that have been brought up that has, have not already been addressed by our panel? I think they've all been been addressed. I mean, the the biggest consideration is concerns about legal issues. We've discussed concerns about vandalism. We've discussed space being an issue and where to place the vending machine in the agency. I think there's an overall lack of education. Having ongoing discussions with our partners in the criminal legal system is so important, and that it's it's really not about money, because we have been able. Um, to work with Tara Blair and with Lucy to offer these no cost machines and we've worked with CORE to be able to provide no cost naloxone so it's it's not about money it's more about systemic issues. The one thing I will say is that HEAL has been able to upgrade some of the vending machines to provide overdose education through a video on the machine and then with discussions with some of the jails they wanted a token mechanism in place on the vending machine so that that would help with concerns about the overdose education and liability issues. And then also help address some of the concerns about, you know, too much naloxone flying off the shelf and they can't keep up with demands. And um, they, they were concerned about that as well, which from this panel doesn't sound like it has been an issue. But I appreciate all of the advice that everyone has shared. Yeah, thanks, Carrie. And to pivot now to a question about um, work in Louisville, and um, Chanel, I saw your question up above as well about working with urban law enforcement. Chelsea and Jessica, maybe you could talk a little bit about working with urban law enforcement in, um, in Las Vegas around the implementation of your machines. Sure. So um, when we were opening Track B originally, we had um, law enforcement come in and, and take a quick tour. Um, and then also some of our, and that was for our Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. We have some other police departments locally. So North Las Vegas, Henderson, we mailed them pictures of what we would be giving out um, so that they could see it um, just in case they ever saw anybody with it. Um, and that was about it. Um, we were really lucky that in Clark County, we didn't really have to do a lot of buy-in, but I know that Jessica, um, has worked with law enforcement as well. So you might be able to shed a little light on some things that you've done. Um, yeah, just uh, really to add to Chelsea's piece, I think um, it's, it can be one of the benefits. I think engagement is important, but really understanding um, what your ask is. So if this is at a community site versus at an urban jail, that might be a different conversation of um, you know, please, uh, please don't poach clients who are um, uh, coming out of these locations, but that's also perhaps a reason to offer a diverse amount, uh, set of products at a variety of community locations um, who are likely already serving many of the clients who could um, benefit from, uh, from those services. So happy to talk more in depth. April, if I can just add one component, I know we're specifically talking about jails, but when I think of urban uh, law enforcement agencies, I think of agencies that sometimes are very large. And so just the structure to get to a sheriff is much different than it is, say, in one of our smaller, more rural agencies. And so I think, uh, Chanel, a great question, kind of knowing where you live and where you work. And in some of the larger agencies I know, like Detroit is not far from us, they are just a monster of an agency compared to our size. But um, that uh, uh, that district captain 
um, has a lot of authority, right? Um, or even that uh, that post commander for the Michigan State Police has a lot of authority. So sometimes you don't need to go all the way to the top to get to the sheriff or the chief. But if you are in a particular uh, a very large urban area, it might be that sergeant, that lieutenant, that captain, um, just depending on your structure. So I just wanted to offer that, that um, knowing where you live and your work, I think is also important because you might be able to get easy access to the captain um, who could at least start to pave the way alongside you. And it might take you, a, I know some uh, deputies who work in other agencies who never personally met their own boss, their sheriff, right? So some agencies are just so massive, like in LA County, for example, you may never get a chance to really meet the sheriff, but you could get to that post commander. Just, I wanna echo what Derek is saying. Like I just recently moved to a new community and I try and meet the jail administrator because that's who usually gets a lot of things done in these facilities rather than the sheriff. So I think that uh, not just trying to go directly to the sheriff, sometimes trying to find those people running the day-to-day -day can be the way to go too. Yeah, thank you, Brad. Chanel, you have your, your hand raised. I don't know if your comments and questions were addressed in the chat or did you have an additional one you wanted to voice? I just wanted to make sure it was clear. Um, yeah, so thankful. thank you, Derek. And I forgot who was talking a minute ago. I was typing at the same time about um, who to contact in these large urban areas because it does kind of get a bit complicated, especially after the situations have already started. But yes, that is our situation right now. I believe seven of those um, people who have passed um, have been notated as overdoses. And so my specific committee in the coalition is wanting to address the well path um, contract that the jail has and who has training and what does training look like and what does screening look like because um, we are getting contact from inside the jail that many of these people are actually detoxing. So they're not overdosing. Um, and we know that they're trying to add that overdose number to whatever large schema that they have for harm reduction, but we want to be able to like clarify that correctly. And if this is a contract that you have who are your contractors who are healthcare providers um, and what training do they have inside? So I didn't know if anyone um, with this particular program had any issues with those, um, those healthcare providers. Big time. And I'll just say that I think if you've met one in jail healthcare provider, you've met one in jail uh, healthcare provider. So even within the same company, I have had WellPath nurses, WellPath uh, health you know, staff that are totally pro medication and in the same company, a couple counties away, totally against. So um, it is a huge struggle and people do not talk enough about those folks being the barrier sometimes. We've encountered the exact same thing in this project uh, in, the, in the healing community study, really with the healthcare contract healthcare provider in some cases being, being the major barrier. This is so reassuring because um, that's our next demand that we want to push is that we totally address this and we've done some background on it for months and it seems like we're on the right track and I'm just thankful for you all. You all are doing totally amazing work and this has been awesome. I know Chanel, I was just going to mention you're right on with the contract piece. And so uh, um, for us, our sheriff was very forceful with our uh, the contractors that we worked with. They said, we're doing this. Um, and if you don't want to get the training and really be on board with us, we'll find a different direction to go. Um, and so I remember us having that conversation early on. Again, less related to the vending machines. Ours was about MAT, medically assisted treatment in our jail. Um, but that was something that our sheriff was very forceful uh, with our contract partners. And you know, other facilities do that when they go out and look for a contractor, they are very specific in what they're looking for, you know, all three forms of medications, new inductions. And I think that's a way to get the right folks in the door when you have those opportunities to, to get a new con contractor in. And one other piece, Chanel, you may be the, uh, the, the, the knowledge that that law enforcement agency needs, because I'll just say again, our folks didn't know what we didn't know. So when we're doing our original RFPs, we're not even thinking about these kinds of questions. So you being that great uh, um, educational partner for your local agency, I think is also an important piece. Yeah, thank you all. I feel like this discussion on many fronts could go on for another 30 minutes. I've talked with Lisa about, I wish we had made this two hours because we could really talk about a lot of different aspects. Um, I do wanna bring us to a close so that folks can sign off if they have other meetings. But um, I know Lisa has a few uh, CEUs 
um, sort of item she needs to discuss. I just want to put in here food for thought, and maybe this is for a second uh, learning collaborative on vending machines, but we've talked a lot about the machines and gels and, and re uh, recovery centers and elsewhere, but we can also be thinking about these uh, in MOUD providing uh, areas. I know Chelsea has experienced putting machines for syringe vending in MOUD provider offices. We can also think about these machines in probation and parole offices. I mean, they're just the sky's the limit, I think, as someone mentioned. And so I would just encourage you to think creatively and get on that collaborative that Jessica and Chelsea have started. Just start sharing ideas and hearing others' ideas about these models. Um, all right, Lisa, I'll turn it to you to wrap up the business part. Okay, I'll just go over uh, how to 